Principles of Economics, my complete guide to understanding economics is now available in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook from Safeddeen.com, Amazon, and many more booksellers worldwide. And now I am also teaching a course based on this book on my website, Safeddeen.com. Principles of Economics will run the whole academic year from September to June, and will have a new lecture every two weeks, as well as weekly live online discussion seminars open to learners from all over the world and from all walks of life. Whether you're a student, a professional, or a retiree, you are making economic decisions every day, and this course will arm you with the wisdom of centuries of economists to improve your economic decision-making. You'll also get a free book of Principles of Economics if you sign up for the course. Go to safeddeen.com and sign up now. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Orange Pill App, the Bitcoin-only social network that connects you with high-signal Bitcoiners, events, and now merchants as well. If you're like me and can't stop talking about Bitcoin, you know how challenging it can be to talk to the no-coiners and how nice it is to talk to someone who gets you. With the Orange Pill app, you can find the Bitcoiners near you and they can replace the no-coiners in your life. You can organize events and meetups with local Bitcoiners and wherever you travel, you can meet up with local Bitcoiners all while being as anonymous as you like. So if you want to build your local network of Bitcoiners, find a Bitcoin meetup or merchants accepting Bitcoin, head over to orangepillapp.com to sign up or download the app from the App Store or Google Play Store and send me a DM so we can get connected. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin Standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin Standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin Standard. Use the code Bitcoin Standard to get 5% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by the Bitcoin Way, your professional Bitcoin IT team offering you personalized, secure, and comprehensive solutions for every step along your Bitcoin journey. The Bitcoin Way offer live concierge service to guide you with your Bitcoin cold storage, running your node, privacy best practices, inheritance planning, corporate strategy, and multi-sig solutions. They don't touch your coins, they guide you through the process of acquiring your coins and securing them. If you'd like to make your setup safer and more reliable, book a consult with them and see what they have to suggest. If you want to give someone the gift of Bitcoin, get them this professional service that will ensure they start off knowing exactly how to manage their coins and not lose them. Go to thebitcoinway.com and start Bitcoining more confidently. All right, I am uh, uh, very happy to have uh, Saifedean Amos on the show today. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, if people are not familiar, Saif is uh, an economist and a world-renowned author um, known for uh, a lot of his work in the Bitcoin space. Of course, he wrote The Bitcoin Standard, which is an internationally best-selling book. Um, where I'm going to anger my audience today because I've got safe on the show. I've had so many people for years have wanted me and you to have a conversation about Bitcoin. Now we're sitting down and that's not really the topic for today's show. Uh, we will do another podcast at some point uh, all about Bitcoin, I promise. Um, but uh, I was interested to have you on because you've also been um, an outspoken uh, critic of uh, the Israeli government and of course their, their treatment of the Palestinian people. And you are yourself Palestinian and I must confess, I have not talked to anyone who's Palestinian through this whole thing. And I've done many shows on the topic. I did uh, do a show, uh, the Dean show with uh, um, uh, Eddie, who's a Muslim, but he's not Palestinian. And you're not only Palestinian by blood, but you actually grew up uh, over there. Is that right? Yes. So, and you were, and you grew up in the West Bank? Yeah, in Ramallah. Okay, and so uh, I'm just curious because I don't know this stuff. So how how long were you there? I was there from 1990 until 1998. I finished high school there. Okay. That's uh, when I uh, lived there. So you have uh, something that 99.999% of people commenting on this situation really don't have, which is that you actually have experience living under the occupation. So, yes, I have. 
So what was, um, before we get into just kind of like talking about what's going on, the history of the war, or we could talk about whatever you want to, but what was that like for you? I mean, like, what were your experiences living under foreign military occupation? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not a lot of fun. Um, it's not a fun thing to look back upon. Um, it's not a fun uh, place to be. Essentially, um, it's gotten a lot worse now than it was back then. But I've seen and I've followed the progression of how it's just continued to get worse and worse. Within the West Bank, you have the Israeli military that essentially controls the place. And they've effectively controlled it since 1967 even though the Palestinian Authority has some kind of authority, but ultimately it is the Israelis who uh, run the place. And uh, their uh, main mission is to just try and get rid of as many Palestinians as they can and to try and capture as much land as they can. I mean, this is really the key concept you understand. They want more land and fewer Arabs. That's the way they, they see it. And so they do everything they can to try and get you to leave. They do everything they can to make your life miserable. And they try and get as much of your land as they can. And that just colors the entire experience of uh, living there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. And of course, it's a, a situation that I would say if any, I, I think if any group of people found them, any group of human beings, as we know them, found themselves in that situation, they would uh, find it unacceptable, unbearable, and wish to resist it. And I think that, to me, at least seems to be the bottom line of the Israel-Palestinian conflict since at least 1967, although we could probably go back quite a bit before that, but at, at least since 1967, that is the underlying dynamic that at least from you know my you know conclusion after doing a lot of studying uh, is that no matter how much people on the kind of pro-Israeli side want to argue about everything else, you kind of just can't get away from that underlying fact that you just can't say you're going to occupy and dominate a, a people indefinitely. And, and keep stealing right, their land. And, right. And, and keep continue, their yeah. land continuously uh, throughout the whole period. Yeah, that's right. And the, and really, this is, uh, you know, I, it, it, you shouldn't say uh, I shouldn't start at 1967 and it could go back to the 1920s or something like that. But certainly, at least since the creation of Israel. And as uh, um, I know, I've, I've heard because I watched you debate Walter Block and you brought up, uh, I believe you brought up Ilan Pape uh, in that debate. And I've, I've read a bunch of his books. And then, of course, the response is always to go to like character assassination. So there's something, well, he's a leftist or something like that. And you're like, yeah, OK, uh, yeah, sure he is. I'm sure we think he's wrong about a whole bunch of other stuff. But he really lays out in great detail that it's not just what happened in 1947 and 1948, but that every year after that. Every year after that, there was more ethnic cleansing and more ethnic cleansing. In some years, it may have only been a few hundred Palestinians, but it was cons a constant process of kind of a lot at once and then just slow ethnic cleansing over the years, over the years, and basically up until today. Yeah, and it continues. And um, essentially, if you uh, see it from the perspective of anything that Israel does is justified self-defense, and nothing the Palestinians do is justified self-defense, then you just have this um, dominant, stupid narrative that people have, which is Israel is this stranded David defending itself from all of these Goliaths that surround it, which is the complete opposite of reality. This is a uh, this is a, this is an, a, a foreign population that came in funded massively and armed massively with foreign weapons and has been stealing land. Um, the key thing I keep bringing this up is that in 1945, the British conducted a very, very thorough and accurate um, assessment of land ownership in Palestine. And from the privately owned land, forgetting all the public land, just the privately owned land, which is about 56% of all the land was privately owned, from that, about 10% was owned by Jews. So 5.6% of the entire territory was owned by Jews or the Jewish National Fund. And 90% of private property there, about 46% approximately of all the land was owned by Muslims and Christians. And so this was the point at which they already had, with the help of the British, established the state and built a military and carried out the process of ethnic cleansing 
hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their home. Right. You know, I, I one of the things, because I know, you know, I kind of grew up because I'm Jewish. So I grew up w- with the official Israeli propaganda being all that I ever heard of the story. Even the, the, so the story is, you know, told to you basically that like, oh, you know, like this, there's this group of uh, our, our people. We were mistreated all throughout the world and we wanted to start our, our homeland here with, with the land without people for we're people without land. And then all these Arabs just attacked us, this little group. And they just all attacked us, all these surrounding countries, just because we declared independence, you know, okay. Like all of that aside, which is not exactly the real history of it. But then the story is always like, and somehow, miraculously, we won. We won, even though all of these countries. And I, I do look back at it now and I go, isn't it? I guess that's in the story where my eyebrow should have raised initially. Because that that sounds kind of crazy. Like, wait, you, you're just this little puny minority who's just been beat up by everybody. And then all of these nations attack your one day old nation and you win. Well, how exactly does that happen? And then, like, the more you actually study the history, you realize that, oh, well, because that's not the story. Because the story is actually that a group of incredibly well-financed Europeans who had, like, international bankers behind them went in there and and developed these very sophisticated, very badass, very cruel militias – many of whom were blatantly involved in terrorism before the creation of uh, the immediately before the creation of Israel. And that's why they won because they were basically coming in with first world financing, picking on people who didn't have anything like that, backing them up. And also because they were, their real enemy in that war was the Palestinian population. It wasn't the Arab militaries right. and the Palestinian population had essentially already been effectively disarmed. There was no Palestinian military. There was no Palestinian police. There, They were disarmed between 1936 and 1939 by the British with the help of these same Zionists. So the Zionist movement had already been extremely militant and extremely political and extremely organized and had the British Empire behind it, clear on the idea that we want to set up a Jewish state. And they did do that in 1948. And they did do that by kicking out somewhere between 800,000 to 1 million people from their homes. And they destroyed their homes. They destroyed their entire villages. More than 500 villages have been completely destroyed. And that was just in 1948. Many more have been destroyed since, and many are still getting destroyed until today. And they um, uh, confiscated effectively the land. This is what it ultimately comes down to for the libertarians out here who are sold the garbage propaganda about Israel being some kind of a freedom haven. Israel was created out of the government's confiscation of the land of the people that they chased out at gunpoint. And the state continues to own 93% of the land of the country. 93% is owned by the state. And that can't be owned privately by anybody. It can only be leased to Jews. So any person from anybody anywhere in the world who claims to be Jewish can go there and get land effectively leased at extremely subsidized rates. The same land that is being confiscated today or was confiscated at any point between 1948 until today through this massive um, process of ethnic cleansing. And these Palestinians were kicked out of that land cannot buy that land or go back to it under any possible scenario. There's nothing we can do. My wife's family, they left at gunpoint from Yaffa, which is now south of Tel Aviv, and they left to Beirut, and they had property in Manshiya in Yaffa, and they can't access it. They can't go back to it. There's no amount of money that that family could put up in order to go back to that piece of land. But random fat ass dudes from long island like yakov look him up uh, the guy who came up with israel's uh, motto if i don't steal it someone else will just some random dude from long island who can go to palestine and kick a palestinian family out of their homes and take over their home because he's jewish and they're not that's what it really is so if you support some kind of free market uh, idea if you think the state should have intervened The entire existence of the state of Israel is just one massive government intervention in the market of land for Palestine. This is it. It's just one massive government distortion, violently enforced, where the military steals land, 
and the government administers that land to anybody from anywhere in the world who claims to be Jewish and prevents the owners of that land from keeping it, no matter how much money they pay, because it just assigns them collective guilt for whatever any of them does in self-defense or in any shape or form. They're all guilty of it all, so they all get to go and they all can't come back. Yeah, it's really something. I mean, look, and again, I know there's people, because it's just kind of the nature of human beings. No matter what issue you have, no matter how blatantly wrong something is, there will be people who do mental gymnastics to try to somehow defend the indefensible. I mean, you know, you debated Walter Block. That was the name of the book he wrote. Uh, so he's really taking it to the next uh, level with this uh, with this war. There are a few things that, like, to me, were just you know, in kind of reassessing my view on all of this and reading a, a lot about it, there were just things where it's like, yeah, you just can't get away from that. And one of the major ones to me was that point that you're making right there, that I, I somehow, well, okay, this may not apply to me anymore, but before I started podcasting about all this stuff, I have the right to go to Israel tomorrow and just, and that's it. It's, I have a right to go there. Yet somebody who was there, I mean, 1948 is like, it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. There are people who were alive, you know, during this time who are still alive right now. Um, fewer and fewer of them as the years go on. But there are, but the, the guy who actually owned a house there is not allowed to return. But yet some random Jew from Brooklyn, New York can just go there. And, and you just can't get past that. I mean, that's if you if you believe in property rights in any sense, not even being uh, strict libertarians like me and you are. I'm just saying like your normie person who just kind of feels like, you know, based. Yeah, OK, I own my house or something like that. It's just indefensible. And I will say I, you know, I, I watched recently um, the Lex Friedman podcast where they had a very long debate um, a two on two, uh, a debate about the history of this. And, and it's like, it's painful to me to hear like Benny Morris, who, you know, knows better making these like kind of ridiculous, uh, defenses for the ethnic cleansing. And like, it, it's like, it wasn't an ethnic cleansing, but if it was an ethnic cleansing, then maybe we should have done more of the ethnic cleansing and all of this stuff. And the argument that he seems to be making Look, I know Nazi comparisons are lazy quite often, but I, I, it's the identical argument that I've heard Holocaust deniers make, which is that what they'll say is that you can't find the official document that that says it is the policy of the Zionists to ethnically cleanse all of these people. But you do have what you can find, essentially. And by the way, this is what Holocaust deniers argue about the Holocaust. You can't find the official document where Adolf Hitler orders the uh, German people to go genocidal. And it's like, OK, yes. But what we do have is that he talked about doing it for many years. A bunch of people at the top level of government talked about doing it and then they did it. So that's enough. That's more than enough to create a narrative of uh, which is what historians do. And that's essentially the same thing here that, that you have with the early Zionist settlers. Transfer was talked about over and over and over again from all of the top Zionist officials. And then when they had the opportunity to, they did it. And we're sitting here arguing over whether there was an official document that said we were going to do it. We, I mean, we know what happened here. And again, there's one of the things about 1948 not being that long ago is we also have firsthand testimony from people on both sides of it. I'm sure you've seen those compilations of uh, of old Israeli soldiers talking about what they did in the war. And some of them kind of laughing and kind of expressing this kind of sociopathic glee about it. Others seem kind of ashamed about it, but they all talk about what they did. This is not really up for debate. Yeah, it's predominantly up for debate in the U.S. where and, and like outside in the rest of the world. In in Israel, the sentiment is much more like, yeah, we did it. I think now as well. I mean, I would say maybe in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there was a more um, denialist and also kind of more decent conception of what Israel is. So for people that was, you know, we would never do something like this. And even if we did it, you know, we just don't talk about it. But now it's a lot more like, yeah, we did it and uh, we should do more of it and uh, we're going to do more of it. And uh, it's only the only real debate you see, um, unfortunately, within kind of um, most uh, 
um, discourse there is whether we should uh, be very public about it so that the world could hold it against us or whether we should just uh, try and not be very public about it. But yeah. um, the let's be public about it side seems to be winning that debate. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I got to say, I'm, I've been a little bit surprised that after the uh, ICJ ruling, there's still they've still been so blatant about their rhetoric because you would have thought at least at that point they'd go, hey, let's not like broadcast exactly what our intentions here are. Um, but it has not it has not slowed them down one bit. I'll tell you, and this is maybe a little bit of a conspiracy uh, speculating, but there are I'll, ju I'll just say this. Sometimes it seems to me that you know, you see people like uh, um, that Rabbi uh, Shmuley Botek and, and people like this. And it, it just seems to me like, you go, are you trying to create more hatred of Jewish people? Like, is that your goal? Because if that was your goal, you couldn't be doing a better job. And I, I will say there's, there's this weird dynamic um, that's been true from the very beginning of Zionism, where in a, a strange way, there is this symbiotic relationship between hatred of Jews and the Zionist agenda where they actually kind of work well together. And th this is part of the reason why uh, the Stern gang wanted to ally with the Nazis in the very beginning of World War II. And it was only because Adolf Hitler really didn't like Jews so much that he wasn't willing to do it. But you could understand where the, the Zionist agenda at the time very much lined up with Hitler's agenda. I mean, Hitler was like, we want to kick all the Jews out of Europe. And the Zionists were like, yeah, it's exactly what we want. We want all the Jews to leave Europe and come here. And still to this day, there is this dynamic where the only justification that Israel has for what it's doing to Gaza right now has to rely on there's there's this huge hatred of Jewish people everywhere. And it almost does seem like it seems like drumming that up might actually be their goal. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's true for sure, but I do know for sure that they are creating more hatred of Jewish people and that they also benefit from that to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I think my honest opinion is that Zionism is a form of ethno-nationalism from late 19th century, early 20th century Eastern Europe. And we've seen how that one works out. Uh, we've had all of 20th century European history as one giant open air experiment in how that works out. And the answer is not well. That stuff doesn't really uh, work very well. It particularly doesn't work when done by an imported population in a land in which they are a tiny minority. So in 1917, when the Balfour Declaration was issued by the British uh, government, Jews constituted something around 5% of the local population, but they were a part of the population. And the, you know, when people talk about anti-Semitism, it's worth understanding how things were back then. There's a, there's a, a, a diary by a Polish Hasidic rabbi who traveled to Palestine in 1747. And he describes how in Hebron, the Jews there live and they have an open courtyard where they leave it unlocked during the Sabbath and nobody comes to them. And then they celebrate with all of the others and everybody here loves the Jews. And for him, it's it's unique that because, you know, he's used to Poland. Uh, this is different in Palestine. They're loved and they're celebrated and they're respected. And that was really the case. They could own property up until uh, 1948. It was possible for Jews to own property. And that's how Zionist Europeans came to Palestine and purchased property legally. Only after 1948 did this become an issue. Only then did the land market become ethnicity-based. Before that, for 1,300 years, you had a practically free market in land. And specifically, that started, ironically, and most people don't know this, of course, that started in 637 with the Muslim conquest because it was the Islamic conquest of Palestine that allowed Jews back in because Jews were exiled five centuries earlier. They came back thanks to the Islamic conquest when Omar, the second caliph in Islam, entered Jerusalem. He got some Jews from Arabia with him historians who could figure out from Jerusalem where the temple was, and they figured it out, and it was a trash dump. The Romans had turned it into a trash dump. 
And they figured out where it was and they cleaned it and they rehabilitated it and they built a mosque on it and they allowed the Jews to pray there as well. And since then, Jews had lived there while all of this anti-Semitic drama was happening in Europe, allowing them to develop this kind of PTSD ethno-nationalism that brings all of that anti-Semitism to Palestine and projects it on the local population, which had accepted Jews for 1300 years. Muslims and Christians and Jews had coexisted and lived there. And trouble only starts when you when you tie the land ownership and the state and citizenship to the ethnicity, as it would in any other situation in any other country. It's not complicated. If you did the same thing, you know, that's what I asked Walter Block. If you did the same thing in Louisiana, Louisiana is about 10% French at this point. So you could say Louisiana should be a French homeland. I mean, you could start a religion that believes that and have a holy book that says Louisiana should be French. And it's 10% of them. And now all the non-French can't own land anymore. How would Walter Block feel about that? And I think more interestingly is the question I asked him, why doesn't he campaign for something like that? Why does he uh, feel so strongly about it that he writes a book in defense of that happening in my uh, land, but he doesn't want the same for America in his land? Well, it does seem like um, the with a lot of people, this is certainly not exclusive to Walter Block, although it is, um, I, I will admit, it's much more troubling and slightly heartbreaking to hear him uh, make these mistakes. But lots of people, um, and this has really been on display since October, it's, it's amazing how much people contradict themselves or contradict the foundation of everything they believe in when the topic of Israel comes up. And I'm not 100% sure why exactly that is. I have my suspicions, but it's amazing. I mean, watching all these people, you know, the Ben Shapiro types who like made millions of dollars railing against cancel culture and uh, being pro-free speech, uh, opposing identity politics. And yet when the topic of Israel comes up, they all become blue haired 19 year old college freshman chicks who like all they can do is, I mean, I literally just, uh, I want to see that if I have this exchange right here, because it's just earlier today, I just had another one of like the thousandth uh, of these things. But so, um, uh, Daryl Cooper, are you familiar with, uh, with Daryl Cooper? Who's, who's great. Um, and is really just read. Oh yeah. Martyr made. Yes. Martyr. He's yeah. martyr made on Twitter. His his podcast series about the history of Israel Palestine is, is phenomenal. People should really check that out if you have the time. But so he he wrote a thing um to this guy Richard Goldberg. So he he writes a uh, um he, this is his tweet. I'll read it. He said uh he said um um so so he's talking about the world uh, central kitchen that was a uh, um uh, that was to feed hungry people. It was developed after the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Um, and they uh, ha have since been serving people after disasters in many countries, including Gaza. And he, he writes this, he writes, the IDF purposely murdered several of the uh, WCK, the World Central Kitchen's uh, aid workers in three separate strikes to pick off survivors trying to escape. Um, Andres uh, expressed his grief and outrage over this crime, and all three, uh, all three execrable uh, human scum can do is call him an, an anti-Semite, disgusting, disgraceful, um, and you disgrace yourself by standing with people like Goldberg. So that's what he said. And this Richard Goldberg, uh, Goldberg's response is, people like Goldberg? Why don't you just say what's really on your mind? Let it out. So his only response to this is what? It's like what the woke college kids' response is. You're a racist. You know, this is like, anyway. Um, exactly, exactly. It's so pathetic. And it's it's amazing because they've monetized and built an entire brand on their opposition to that and on the whole idea that you being gay does not mean that I need to say things or you being trans does not mean that, and that I should say things. And that sounds so edgy until it comes to this government owned land plot that they insist must be managed on an ethno basis and now everybody must unite you know this is if, if you wanted to summarize somebody like ben shapiro this kind of giant class of parasites that keep repeating this message essentially which is 
Every, identity politics is bad, but we should all unite behind Israel, you know, <laughs> then send it unlimited money and weapons. And that's just basic common sense. And if yeah. you don't do that, then obviously you're just a racist. I mean, to be to be a Zionist who rails against identity politics just in itself, like how does your head not explode from the contradiction of that? It is that. Yeah, I always it, wondered, like, why wouldn't you support something like this being done here in the States? with a similar dynamic where the Christians only can own land and minorities cannot. And then why don't you lobby for something like that there? Yeah. I and mean, what did you do if that happened? What would, what, what would you do if there, a candidate ran on that platform? Like imagine uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir and Bezalel Smotrich, basically the two most important people in Israeli politics at this point, they're the extremist wing that um, decides if the government stays in power or not. And they capture a lot of the sentiment in, um, in in this war, and they've been uh, instrumental in it. Well, let's do a thought experiment. What happens if an American politician decides to run on a similar platform, but replacing uh, Jews in Israel with Christians in America? What would you do as an American then? Yeah, I mean, and to ask the question answers it in itself. And and the other thing that's crazy to me is that. You know, I remember watching over, you know, it's not that long ago, but it was back in 2017, 2018, how much the neocons hated the alt-right types, like the white nationalist guys who had their march in Charlottesville or whatever, and the neocons would be all over just how horrible they are. And then you just kind of realize it's like, yeah, but you're, you're the same, only for Israel. You're like the exact same people. You believe in the ethno state down to everything down. I mean, down to the like, you know, like when they'd be like, well, this is why Donald Trump's rhetoric of build the wall is so upsetting and all of this. And you're like, oh, oh OK, but you're a, how like how can you you know what I mean? It's just it's so bizarre to me that you go, OK, so you're against ethno nationalism and building a wall. Yet you unborn, you no. support Israel. And the U.S. wall is built on U.S. territory. It's uncontroversial territory. It's uncontroversial border. There's no dispute between the Mexicans and the U.S. as far as I know. But Israel, of course, refuses to declare its border in the West Bank because if it does declare its border, then it either has to take in the Palestinians and then make them either equal citizens, which it doesn't want to do because then af even after a century of fiat bullshit, yeah, they still can't get a majority or they're still very close to 50%. So they can't just go and give everybody uh, passports and just make them equal Israeli citizens because that defeats the whole point. They want to keep this an ethno-nationalist state. And so they want to keep their cake and eat it too. They want to keep the West Bank and continue to steal land and continue to drive people away as much as they can to change the status quo and continue to build settlements. And this is the key thing. This is the thing. When you talk to Zionists, I, I just had a debate with Aaron Brook, which should be out soon on the Robert Breedlove show. Oh my when God. I, you, now I have to, now I'm, I'm sentenced to go listen to that, but God, I cannot stand that guy. Well, anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad he debated uh, somebody. Yeah, but I mean, it, it got to the point where he says, okay, well, I condemn the settlers, but in their mind, they don't have the capacity because of all of the damage that the fiat Zionist propaganda does. They don't have the capacity of processing the consequences of something like this. They just think of it as, well, I'm going to say I condemn it, and therefore that just uh, – you can't use it as a part of the argument. I'm still going to believe that Israel is doing good. I'm still going to believe that they are the victim, even though they're stealing people's land and they're kicking their land, them out of their homes and bringing in – fat Long Islanders like Yakov to take their homes. You're still going to just say, I condemn that. And then as you know, as, as if the victims of that are just supposed to say, oh, well, Yaron Brooks says he condemns it. And now we can just um, get on with our lives. But it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's been 76, 77 years of um, this violent repression. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, I think that the 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 damage of the settlements for what for anybody who doesn't know what what we're referring to basically is the fact that so again rough history and i've gone through this a lot on the podcast but just very quickly rough history right uh the the 
the UN partition recommendation in 1947 offered uh, the Jews about 55% of, of the territory. The Arabs rejected this immediately because the, the Jews only owned like 5% of the land there and they were a minority of, of the population. And they were, they were like, no, this is ridiculous that they should get this much. Yeah, I then, think the way to think about it is imagine the United Nations goes to your country and says 55% of this country needs to go to this government new government that we're going to be setting up that's going to get 50 percent of the country that's going to own it it's going to have a land agency it's called the israeli land authority that's just going to own all of the land and if you don't like it then they're going to just have to launch a war against you yeah and and imagine and they were like okay well we have to give uh over half of your country to these people um because they were like horribly mistreated in asia and you'd be like, wait, well, oh, okay, but like, why shouldn't they get a part of Asia? And you're like, no, 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 don't worry about it. We all, we voted on it. And um, all of the Asian countries agreed that you should give up 50% plus of your land. Yeah. And you're like, wait, wait, so what? Like, who cares if they said that? Because there wasn't, as Daryl Cooper points out, there wasn't like a country within like a thousand miles of Palestine who voted for the partition yeah. recommendation. Um, anyway. So then after uh, the war in, uh, in, in 48, the, the Zionists take much more than that 55%, closer to 78% of the land, and they, so they keep that. And then after the war in, in 1967, they essentially took 100% of it and have had control of that ever since. And so the settlements are them building uh, huge communities on the, the remaining 22% where the Palestinians live, but is under Israeli control. And so it's not just the fact that they're building settlements there. It's the, symbolically what it demonstrates to the Palestinian people is that you're never getting this back. You're never getting, you're never even going to get the 22% that's left. Forget about getting back to, you know, like any of the territory you used to have. And so the, the message basically is that you should be hopeless you should be hopeless to ever not live under this totalitarian rule. And that is, uh, and this doesn't justify uh, terrorism or killing of innocent people or anything like that, but that is a perfect recipe to create terrorism, to tell people that you're living under totalitarianism and it's permanent. You never have any hope. And that is terrorism in itself. Yes, it is terrorism. Absolutely. It is yes. not morally distinct in any way from the, um, the indiscriminate terrorism that targets civilians. This is the thing. Ultimately, if you believe in initiating violence against people who haven't um, initiated violence, then you are engaging in terrorism. If you want to, if, if you want to use the term in any way other than the kind of um, Orwellian way in which it gets used in mainstream media, which is right. anybody in the U.S. doesn't like. The, the idea of terrorizing civilians in order to achieve political games, in order to get the civilians to move, that's um, th that's essentially what Israel has been doing all along. And they were the ones who brought in the terrorism to the region. I mean, read about Israeli terrorism in 1947 and 1948. It makes the Palestinians look like amateurs. And one of the biggest explosions done in the 20th century was in the King David Hotel, or maybe it's one, it was one of the other ones. But they broke records. Uh, they killed like 91 people, including some Jews. My own grandfather escaped, uh, ha had left the building minutes before, uh, minutes after, um, no, minutes before, obviously. He left minutes before uh, the, the whole building was uh, blown up. This was very common. And the point was to terrorize the population to get them to leave. It was very well understood. And that's what they did. Yeah, and, and, and uh, just so people know, it's not uh, – th they expressly, openly admitted this. It's not as if this is like like the label terrorism is uh, like a label that you're putting on the, uh, the Zionist militias right up the – right previously to the creation of the state of Israel. They openly said – Menachem Begin openly said that like, yeah, we think this is a legitimate tool and that they were – in from their perspective, um, because it uh, – you know, at this point – Late in the game, basically by by the during World War II and after World War II, basically the British had pissed everybody off. 
the the Arabs didn't like him and the Jews didn't like him either anymore. And they were kind of in this impossible dance where for many years they were trying to appease the Zionists. Uh, there were uprisings as a result to this. Then they tried to appease the Arabs by limiting uh, Jewish migration into Palestine in the run up to World War Two and during World War Two that that pissed the Zionists off. So they were kind of in this position where like they couldn't they just didn't know what to do. This is why they ultimately threw their hands up and kicked it over to the UN. But in the meantime, the Zionists openly embraced terrorism and their defense was that the British were an occupying force. And so terrorism was a legitimate tool to use to drive occupiers out of your land. And it's just funny that that's it's like, OK, so you guys did establish that you think it's legitimate to use terrorism to drive out occupiers. Well, you know, OK, this is the bed that you made. And that, by the way, that's not to say that the Zionists were correct in that. I'm sure me and Save would both agree that you can't kill innocent people. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. I do think we would also agree that you have a right to self-defense. And a soldier coming into your territory is not the same thing as a civilian sitting in the, the territory next door to you. But I'm just making the point that the Zionists really have no moral leg to stand on here to condemn terrorism as a tactic to drive out an occupier. Yeah, and the entire brand rests on moral superiority. And so the entire brand rests on, you know, we have more gay pride uh, parades in Israel than the Palestinians, and therefore we get to take their land. We have more whatever is fashionable to the audience that you're talking to. This is the kind of formula for the Israeli Hasbara. You just uh, emphasize that aspect of it. And there's more of it, obviously, in Israel because, you know, when you've just stolen an entire country, you're going to be doing a lot better than the people whose entire country just got stolen and lost their homes and became refugees with nothing in foreign lands. It's going to be very different. You, you, you took an entire country and then you were able to build on it, which the Palestinians didn't really have the ability to do. But um, – this, this is this is the same kind of justification that they continue to use for, um, to try and pass this off, that we could get to genocide Gaza, we can kill as many civilians as we can because they started it, because they are immoral, they are doing impossibly immoral things. But there is nothing that the Palestinians have done that matches what the Israelis have done in terms of targeting civilians, in terms of terrorizing people, kicking them out of their homes, uh, um, aerial bombardments of civilians. It's, it's incomparable. Yeah. No. And then, and then they always rely on this kind of um, this like hypothetical projection of, so they'll go, well, well, Hamas had genocidal intent or something yeah. like that, or Hamas, you know, and you know, look, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe that's true. I'm sure that there is true for some uh, people in Hamas that would, if they had the power, maybe, you know, like wipe the Jews out or something like that, but they don't have the power to do that. So what are we even talking about? It's like, it's like talking about what a, a schizophrenic homeless guy on the street would do if he had the nuclear codes or something like that. It's like, oh, okay, but that's all just hypothetical. Meanwhile, you got Israel does have the power and is doing what they're doing to the people of Gaza. So how they get you to focus on this hypothetical, you know, I've, I've had people say to me, that, you know, the, the important question is, what do you think Hamas would do if they took uh, power uh, over Israel? And I'm like, Hamas doesn't even have power power in gaza like what are you talking about they, like what what fantasy are you living in that they're ever going to rule over the israelis but israel ruling over the palestinians isn't a fantasy that's what's actually happening and it's i mean of course you understand where they have to distract from that and focus on everything else because, because it's just in their case the actual the actual finance minister of israel is talking about how we should start making our plans for the after war with a population with an Arab population in Gaza of about 100 to 200,000. So he's already making plans for a Gaza with 2 million fewer people in it. That's the plan of the finance minister. You have the president saying there's no such a thing as an innocent civilian in Gaza. You have the prime minister invoking biblical verses specifically saying do not spare any child or um a uh, woman or civilian specifically to appease the base that wants to see this. And it's taking place. We're seeing it that soldiers are chanting about it and it's uh, fully televised. And yet what's really uh, bothering people is the feelings of 
stupid college kids in the US when they hear about random other college kids protesting this stuff rather than the fact that all of this mass murder is taking place, which is <laughs> real genocide. Well, look, I'm, I mean, look, I've, of course, I agree with you. Um, the, and, and it's wild again to see that the sides flip and the people who are now very concerned about college kids feeling safe or whatever, you know what I mean? Or this weird, this weird blurring of the line between hearing something that you don't like and that being the same as, as like violence, uh, which has been kind of, uh, you know, it's been a dominant narrative on college campuses, particularly over the last decade, but it's, you know, so now, but now a bunch of these right wingers are somehow on board with this. Um, but of course, as I'm sure you're well aware, the, the flip side to that is that, man, um, international opinion really has been moved in a way that was unforeseeable to me before this current war, where it does seem like so many people, not just Americans, but around the world, but I'm particularly stunned by in America, how many people are waking up to like, oh, how, how evil what's happening there is. And, um, you know, I've, I was just the other day looking at some of the opinion polls about it. And it is pretty wild that there's something like 50% of democratic voters view it as a genocide. Um, and certainly amongst younger people, I think, um, I think the fact that there's just been so much, uh, so many images and videos out of this war. I mean, I, it's like, I can't go on Twitter any day and not see like another five babies just being crushed to death in a building somewhere. And it's, I do think at least waking a lot of people up to, you know, however horrific um, what happened on October 7th uh, was, and then certainly was, um, and of course there's a lot about October 7th that she'll still should be investigated. Um, but there's pretty much no question that a lot of innocent people were, were killed and it was horrible, uh, what happened, but that, that just can't justify this. I mean, it's it, innocent people getting killed is horrible, but that does not justify just all, killing babies. I mean, it's like the worst thing in the world that any human being could do. And we all see it every single day. And I do think people have kind of, there's at least been a major shift in people's perception of what's going on there for many people. I think so. I kind of hope so. I mean, I, I think it's just been so shocking because uh, for the vast majority of people, you've been lectured incessantly over the last few decades in wherever you live in the world, you've been lectured on this whole human rights um, narrative. Democracies don't do nasty things. We respect human life. And now you're seeing the mask come off because ultimately this really comes down to a, a set of rules that is not applicable to Israel. It's never been applicable to Israel. This, uh, the Holocaust card has been played effectively since 1948, wherein we had all of these international treaties and all of these ways in which governments were uh, supposed to be operating in the new world order. But in the case of Israel, the, 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 the rules were overlooked almost always under the pretext that, well, bad things happened. And it never really, um, it, it never really got the kind of attention that it's getting right now. Because uh, let's face it, there has been an enormous amount of stupid propaganda everywhere, uh, whether it's in Hollywood, TV, media, universities, um, newspapers. All of these places have been hotbeds of um, stupid Zionist propaganda that has massively colored people's brains. And I think if you've woken up from propaganda in um, other parts of your life, which, you know, if you're listening to Dave Smith at this point, then you probably are, <laughs> then um, I, I think you need to imagine uh, going through a similarly transformative large amount of mental uh, clearing of garbage in order to be able to really understand what is going on. Because you've watched so many movies in which the narrative's always been made to sound in a certain way. All the media has been different. And now, I mean, A, we have Palestinians are getting smartphones, so it's getting easier to get the word out. But I think we've also seen an incredibly transformative change in the way Israel has been conducting itself. I mean, the current Israeli leadership is nothing like anything that has existed before. You don't have to be a fan of David Ben-Gurion, and I certainly am not, but you still have to understand this is enormously different from what was going on in 1948. 
Uh, and in most of American, well, most of Israeli history, I mean, I guess Ben Gurion, you could argue, was probably the closest. But this was very different from most uh, of Israeli history in the fact that uh, they're very um, openly clear on the fact that we need to try and get as many Palestinians out of the West Bank and Gaza as we can, as fast as, as we can, capitalizing on October 7 as much as we can. And of course, this is why uh, we've seen this enormous amount of uh, focus on uh, the uh, events of October 7 in, uh, and the magnification of all of these fantastic stories that have been completely proven false, like all of the um, uh, beheaded babies and uh, rape stories. All of that stuff, is, uh, it's, it's been pretty clear that the people behind it are completely untrustworthy liars in many contexts. So it's uh, it, it, but it has been utilized to do this and i think you've seen this over and over and over again in american wars and in, in israeli wars where you get some kind of fake uh, catastrophe like the uh, kuwaiti um incubator babies right. and so on and or you get you magnify some kind of catastrophe and then people become emotional and they get into all kinds of insane decisions, which is effectively what happened then, because it was kind of unthinkable for most people that they would um, that they would support this kind of insane bombing of quantities. But then, if you factor in beheaded babies and all of these stories, then it becomes possible. So uh, people, just like with COVID, you know, people got really scared initially with the uh, early propaganda of um, seven sigma pandemic and uh, once in a century um, flu or whatever the hell they were calling it at that time. Right. Um, and then, you know, everybody was freaked out for a couple of months. And uh, then slowly by, but surely by uh, IQ point, I would say people started to wake up and uh, people started to realize that, yeah, I mean, we see the same pattern when you get this enormous fear and then you get this giant reaction and then you get this weird change in where everybody changes their mind but doesn't talk about it anymore, as we see all with COVID. And uh, I think we're seeing something similar here. Yeah, I know, I know. I know what you mean. And then, of course, in that moment of fear is when powerful people in the government can do things that they always wanted to do anyway. Um, and then because they have their excuse, you know, I'll tell you, I was, uh, so I was born in, I was born in 1983. So the war in Iraq, the Persian Gulf, the first war in Iraq was 91, I believe. So I was eight years old when it happened. And I remember the babies and in incubator story from that, like it made its way down to us eight year olds. And we were like, oh, did you hear this thing? Saddam Hussein's pulling babies out of incubators. And it was just this, and you're like, wow, that's so evil that I guess we got to support, you know, whatever we got to go do to them to stop it. And of course, if people don't know the story. It was famously just made up, all made up. It doesn't even make sense. Like in your head, you're just like, wait. So he was like, he was invading a country and he told his army, we got to stop off at the hospital and pull some babies out of incubators before our next, like just logistically, it doesn't even make sense. You know what I mean? And then of course, no, the whole thing is is just made up. And yeah, with the, the stuff with October 7th, it almost, it, it seemed unnecessary to like add in these claims that didn't actually happen. You know what I mean? But it did. It, it also kind of felt like they're almost like uh, they're testing you to even because as soon as you start going, you know, it's like this tactic that as soon if a bunch of innocent people get killed and then they go, uh, oh, and also they cut off this one woman's head and we're playing with it like a soccer ball. And then they raped all these women and you go, and eh, now there's not actually evidence that that happened. Then they can immediately go, oh, you're downplaying the horrors of October 7th. It's like, well, whoa, 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 hold on. Let's just let's objectively yeah. discuss what actually happened. If you're going to make that claim, you got to have some evidence for it. But to your earlier point that I really do think is is correct. And maybe this is a little bit hard to explain because when we talk about the history, we're talking about how, right, like we said in 48, there was this huge ethnic cleansing um, of of three quarters of a million uh, people or so. And then, of course, you've had the occupation since 1967. There have been uh, military campaigns over and over and over again where people die and horrible things happen. But it is also true that before Netanyahu, the IDF never um, – never behaved in this manner. And they did, they always had assassination campaigns. There, there were, have been, since the, the occupation has been going on, there were always waves of 
um, violence. And there's been violence on all sides. Obviously, a lot more Palestinians killed than Israelis killed. But when there were when there was terrorism under previous um, administrations, they would fight it with special operations. They'd fight it with assassination uh, campaigns and things like that, at least minimizing the amount of innocent people who got who, who get killed. And this since October is just uh, totally different. I mean, this is like there's the Israel is never uh, conducted a military campaign like this before where they have, I mean, and forget even the numbers, you know, whatever the latest numbers are in the, you know, tens of thousands of innocent people have been killed, but the amount of people who are going to die as a result of this is enormous. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people who have like severe food insecurity right now. All of Gaza city has been destroyed. I mean, it's very unclear. And, and it's not as if this is stopping tomorrow, but even if it did stop tomorrow, it's very unclear how many people are going to die as a result of this. I mean, you think about the fact that there's almost no functioning hospitals in in Gaza right now. And so how many deaths come off of that? I mean, it's going to the, the numbers are going to be truly horrific when this is all over. The syllabus for my new online economics course, Principles of Economics, is now available on safeadeen.com. The course will take place over 18 lectures each based on one chapter from my new book, Principles of Economics, which will be available for free as an ebook for everyone registering for the course. Lectures will be released once every two weeks on Mondays, starting on the 25th of September, 2023, and will be available in video and audio format. Live discussion seminars will be held once a week on Thursdays at alternating time slots, 12 hours apart, to ensure learners can attend from all over the world. I'm happy to announce that I have set up my new publishing house and online bookstore, The Safe House, which will be publishing and delivering the best Bitcoin and Austrian economics books worldwide in hardcover, audiobook, and ebook formats. Go to thesafehouse.com to buy my latest book, Principles of Economics, as well as the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard. And now I'm also publishing Fiat Food, Matthew Lishak's amazing investigation into how inflation ruined our diet and health. And I'm also publishing Lynn Alden's Broken Money, her masterful exploration of the failures of the global financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. This is a Bitcoiner's bookshop, so the books are printed in beautiful cloth hardcover made to last with a nice colored dust jacket on top. Go to thesafehouse.com and get yours now. Absolutely. I think it's it's going it's looking like a terrible humanitarian catastrophe. I will say one more thing with relating to October 7. Um, it seems to me that a lot of these stories obviously turned out to be complete nonsense. So the 40 beheaded babies was obviously nonsense from the beginning because like you don't really have time to gather 40 babies, put them together and behead them, which is a, the claim apparently. Yeah. And then it came out that there weren't even 40 babies dead in the entire thing. There was like one baby dead and he died by a gunshot wound um, through a door by mistake, not even targeted deliberately. But it seems to me so many of these uh, particular stories have died. And there is the uh, very simple idea that for Hamas, the, uh, the the most valuable thing to do was to try and get as many hostages as possible. And so all of these uh, stories, the most horrific stories were all about the burning, the idea that Hamas went into all of these homes and started burning people alive, which also makes very little sense because, A, they had, I mean, they just, uh, they didn't have enormous amount of uh, ar artillery to uh, create some kind of uh, massive inferno. Somebody else did, of course, the IDF. And that's effectively what happened. So in many of these places, the, uh, the the Hamas fighters were with civilians and the Israeli military was responding. And the, respond, the response from Israeli military, it's been shown over and over and over and over again that they just shelled indiscriminately. They wanted to make sure to get the Hamas terrorists. And so they wanted to make sure that nobody stayed alive. And they just killed all of the Israelis uh, in many of these cases. So more and more, we're getting few, more and more of these documented cases. But I mean, most people are in the blind rage, still in a stage of blind rage. So for um, for them, they're not able to process this. But realistically, there is no way that all of these cars in the music festival got burned by Hamas. Like, how do you burn so many cars if you're uh, out there with a bunch of AK-47s or, uh, you know, light weaponry? You can't just burn them. And we have all these stories of the Israeli helicopters and Israeli tanks shelling 
um, civilians, Israeli civilians. So you put two and two together, it's very clear that the, the, all of this burning stuff was almost certainly the result of the uh, shelling by the IDF. And so for me, I think uh, Hamas's real objective was to try and get as many hostages. Israel's real objective was always to try and capitalize on this as much as possible to create as much carnage as possible to get as many Palestinians out of Gaza or dead as much as possible. So create a humanitarian disaster, create a refugee crisis. And so for all of that, you can see the the, the logic also behind this indiscriminate shelling because the more indiscriminate shelling means the more dead Israelis, which is going to help us in our uh, long-term goal. And the, uh, and, and the real goal, of course, is to continue to uh, destroy Gaza. And this is where you know, Hamas is, uh, has always um, been intransigent in a way that is ultimately, uh, unfortunately, beneficial to Israel and extremely uh, destructive for the uh, Palestinian people because it gives them the excuse, it hides under the tunnels, and it gives the Israelis the excuse to continue with their ethnic cleansing to the destruction of the Gaza population, hoping to create a refugee crisis. And it's, um, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Yeah, well, look, I mean, this is what uh, Netanyahu was, uh, was arguing um, in front of his... Uh, uh, in, in front of his uh, fellow party members, um, which has been widely reported in the uh, the Times of Israel and Haaretz and even in the New York Times, that he was arguing for years that we got to support Hamas because they actually play right into our hands. And this is the bet. They're, they're the best ones to have over there as the faces so that we can guarantee the Palestinians never get their independence. Because, come on, I could go to everyone in Washington, D.C. and say, well, what do you expect me to sit down with these guys? And they'll go, yeah, OK, fair enough. And so there is this weird I mean, I know, you, you know, you're an, an economist and you wrote the Bitcoin standard where you talk about some of this stuff. Um, but the, the horrible incentives of governments and and, you know, look, you could see where 9-11 happening in America generated enormous profits for weapons companies. And I'm not saying that those I'm not claiming any type of like conspiracy or anything like that. I'm just saying if you look at the way the incentives line up, American innocent Americans dying is good for business. And there's just a lot. This is kind of the nature of governments in general. It's really horrible. They create these awful incentives where you would think, you know, like in any market condition, if your company was responsible for the defense of a group of people, you would be heavily incentivized to not have those people slaughtered. But when you got government in the business of it, it's actually the opposite. And so, yeah, you and and look, you see this. There's like, as I was talking about before, there's this weird relationship between, say, like the terrorists and like the George W. Bush administration, you know, and I say terrorists in the conventional you know, sense of anyone America hates or whatever, you know, but that's like, oh, the, if there's another uh, if there's another terrorist attack somewhere, George W. Bush and his approval numbers go up because everyone's like, oh, we want that guy to defend us from this. And with Netanyahu, I mean, it's just so obvious the guy had hundreds of thousands of people in the street protesting him. He was uh, t- politically done. And now he's kind of through through a monumental failure is politically resurrected. So, I mean, like if you just look at it and you go, OK, so you're the longest serving prime minister in uh, in Israeli history. You had the stated explicit policy of propping up Hamas and then you failed to protect your people against this threat that you were helping to create. And you're rewarded for that. For that, you get to maintain power. And when man, when you got incentives like that, it's very difficult to get any type of positive outcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, there is uh, th- there is a case, I mean, if you wanted to get to the sort of similar conspiratorial position from the kind of uh, Palestinian side, uh, you'd see a similar mirror image wherein in order to be the leadership of Hamas, the leadership of the resistance, you take on that mantle and uh, you get to u- use that beca- and you get to produce the terrorism that is beneficial for the Israelis. So therefore, 
you can see that perhaps in some of the motivation for October 7. I mean, it is something that is completely callous in the uh, toward the lives of Palestinians. And um, it's... It suggests a, a terrible, um, terrible set of incentives, probably for uh, Hamas, because it doesn't even. That it, I mean, you could say on one level that this is Iran. Some people say that claim. I, I don't have an idea personally, but it seems that this was um, motivated by Hamas themselves. Iran doesn't seem to have had a lot of knowledge in it, um, or at least to the extent of it. Because it doesn't look like Iran was uh, particularly excited about starting a war in this way. And it doesn't look like it was in their interest for this thing to start. So Hamas effectively, I mean, trying to explain their incentive, are they just being Iran in stooges? I find that difficult to believe because it's not, it doesn't look to me like it has been in, in Iran's interest to start this particular war. And uh, it seems to me like there is that negative incentive, just like with uh, the Israeli side, they need to escalate in order for to stay in power. I think you see something similar in the case of um, Hamas, and it's absolutely terrible. And I, I think the, the, the cost in terms of humans is just incalculable. Yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, all right. So I should say, though, we should get okay. back to you said this wasn't going to be a Bitcoin podcast, but I'm not going to disappoint your Bitcoin. OK, there you go. Good, good. Because this really people Bitcoin have does fix this, I guess, in some level. Um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin really could have fixed this if Bitcoin was invented, like maybe 10, 20 years earlier, at least. Who knows? But ultimately, I mean, this insane military campaign that they've launched is an extremely expensive war. You could have used that amount of firepower to occupy a much larger country. But, the, you know, they've deliberately tried to destroy as many buildings of Gaza as possible, and they've been systematic in the destruction. This is an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of uh, weaponry, and it would not have been possible without U.S. support, and it not would not have been possible without the U.S. money printer, which makes all horrible things on Earth possible because it provides the horrible people who do horrible things access to a printer that allows them to externalize the cost of this to everybody mm -hmm. else. Yep. And really, ultimately, the only way to fix this is Bitcoin. And it's a doubly significant uh, issue in the case of uh, Palestine, because ultimately, the entire Balfour Declaration, the, the Zionist movement really only got going when they went from a bunch of weird uh, socialist Eastern Europeans to having the British government promise Lord Rothschilds, one of the richest people in the world, that they would work toward delivering this. And why did they do that? They did that in, 19, in World War I in 1917 mm -hmm. when they were losing the war and they needed the Americans to get into the war. And so this was kind of part of the deal for uh, helping America get into the war. And we, of course, uh, for your American listeners, will probably appreciate how much of a horrible decision this was for America. Um, uh, the, the really, arguably, I mean, that period, of course, the establishment of the Federal Reserve was instrumental in that. So World War One becomes the biggest catastrophe in human history because it was the it coincided with the creation of the money printer or the money printers, but turned World War One into this enormous war. You know, European wars were nothing like World War One before World War One. They were limited conflicts that usually took place between militaries yes. in battlefields. And then World War I comes along, and these militaries now have a money printer. Everybody is uh, getting robbed day in and day out into the war effort, and the entire country falls apart. And Britain, I've discussed this in my second book, The Fiat Standard, Britain got into World War I uh, when they considered, when they decided to get in, they released a bond sale. They sold bonds in 1915, I think it was. And in, or 14, I forget exactly, but only a third of those bonds were picked up on the market. And this is really the greatest thing that British people ever did. They only bought a third of their government's money because they realized, why the hell should we get involved in a war between Serbia and Austria and all of these strange European people? Our interest is in the empire. It has nothing to do with this. So they had no reason to get involved. They didn't buy the bonds. The Central Bank of England, the Bank of England went and bought these bonds using a fake line of credit given to two of its employees who bought the bonds in their own private name. And then the Financial Times, the shitcoin media of the day, went and published how successful the bond offering was and that everybody's getting ready for war and we're going to win this war and everything's going to be great and dandy. So, of course, they get into the war with fake printed money. They have to suspend the gold standard. 
and they get dragged into an endless war with a whole bunch of stupid governments who also thought their magic money printer could allow them to fight uh, until uh, victory. And they were all just bogged down and then they needed the Americans to come in. And since then, the world has never gone back on sound money and we've had conflict in the Middle East. So uh, it's it's a very sad situation what is going on, but I still it, it, it almost feel, feels cruel to be bringing this back to Bitcoin. But I still honestly and genuinely believe this is ultimately a monetary phenomenon. Then this notion, because ultimately this is a market distortion. You're distorting the market for land in Palestine, as we discussed earlier, by preventing Palestinians from owning land in all kinds of military means, and then making the land available for Jews from all over the world. This kind of market distortion is very expensive. How do you maintain that? have a bunch of governments who print a bunch of money to finance a bunch of criminal bullshit. Take out the government's money printer and you get rid of a lot of that. We're not necessarily going to have utopia the next day, but people who make the utopia argument are exactly like saying, you know, fixing sewage in your house is going to stop your house from having shit all over it. That is not going to fix your relationship with your wife. Maybe right. might not fix everything in your life and that might make you a billionaire. But you're going to get shit out of your house. And getting this shit of the money printer out of the market for real estate in Palestine, I think it would be the uh, first step toward solving this. Yeah. You know, at the um, at the end of uh, Daryl Cooper's uh, podcast series, he has this uh, this little chunk. And and it's funny because Daryl himself is like a real right winger. Like he's not some lefty hippie or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, but he goes off on this whole thing about how far a recognition and an apology can go and how much that it's like, you know, like, look, even say if, if we were talking about how the, um, you know, the U.S. got land from the Native Americans or how much Native Americans were mistreated or something like that. The conclusion isn't necessarily that like, oh, we should give all the land back to the Native Americans. But your conclusion is certainly like, oh, we should recognize that some things that were pretty messed up happened. And for any Native Americans who are still around, they ought to have their rights protected and they ought to have full you know, citizenship and full rights as, as every other American has. And it's easy to kind of get caught up in the idea that like, oh, man, it's just these there's just been so many atrocities since the creation of the state of Israel and things have been so bad and there's been so much violence and that, that, you know, it's almost like, well, we're just doomed for these people to hate each other forever. But, you know, I'll tell you, you know, I mean, it's like, I went, I went to, um, uh, last year I went to London and did comedy shows in London. And then I jumped on a flight, like a half hour flight and went and did comedy shows in Ireland and like they're right next to each other, you know, and like they're fine. And they were fight they were fighting for so long and so many atrocities. And you know, like France and Germany are like real close. They're just right there, you know. And like they went to they went, you know, in World War One and in World War Two, and the you know, and there's like all of these countries. Like there's areas where where groups of people did horrific things um, to each other, and then moved past it and found peace. And, and how do does, they do that with property yeah, rights? Yes, exactly. They basically stopped imposing on each other. And the, the truth is that I still, at least I hold out hope that like, yeah, like you actually, if you could end this war and just end the occupations and just come to some type of reasonable deal, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think either side is going to get from the river to the sea. I know that's what the Likud party wants. And I know that's what some, uh, uh, some Palestinians want. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but there, there really could just be like a peace agreement, a real peace agreement, not like the BS at Camp David or something like that, but there could be a real peace agreement where like you could, they, people could just stop doing this and things would be much better. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my way of solving this is give both sides from the river to the sea and right. give everybody from the river to the sea. Let's just have a free market in land where anybody can own land. And then all the world's uh, the Jews can just go and buy land. All the world's Arabs, Muslims, Christians can buy land there. And that's it. And it, it's really not that... Uh, it's not that complicated. It's what happens in the vast majority of the world. Um, and the, the difference in uh, in Palestine 
is ultimately that we've never uh, witnessed a situation that allowed Palestinians to just move on. There was never been yeah. a situation where Israelis just said, all right, fine, listen, we won the war, we're going to do this thing, and then you're going to get that piece of land, and that's yours, and it's done. This never happens basically from 1948, and it's never happened in the form of, okay, well, we kicked out a bunch of Palestinians, now let's work with the remaining Palestinians and um, have a country together. That worked in 1948 for the Palestinians in 1948, and that's kind of why they are generally getting along with Israeli society, because they relatively uh, live off a little bit better, but still, you know, their property rights are violated. So a lot of these Palestinians inside Israel who are Israeli citizens are refugees because their villages were some of the villages that were right. destroyed. So some of them ran away from their villages and went to some of the larger cities and became Israeli citizens, but they can't go back to their villages. Their villages are still declared military zones. Most of these villages have been demolished. So, I mean, just imagine the amount of logistics it takes in 1949, 1950, 51 to muster enough uh, equipment to go out and demolish a village. But that's exactly what they did to make sure that these villages didn't happen so that Israel could like control all the strategic uh, area that it could, could control specifically. So they kept... Uh, as few Arabs as they could. This couldn't work in when they took over the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, so we see a return to the same kind of Zionism of the formative years of Israel, which was heavily, heavily influenced by the Zionism of, of uh, Vladimir Yabotinsky. And these uh, Zionists who were very clear from day one that, look, we need to build an iron wall, colonize as much land as we can, kill locals, and move the wall. And just... Uh, it, recapture as much of land of Israel as we possibly could. And in their mind, look, there is no limit with the West Bank and Gaza. I mean, they openly talk about Lebanon. They openly talk about, some of them talk about from the Euphrates to the Nile, which is what the Bible mentions, right. which many people claim, and I think with probably good evidence that this is these are what the two line, blue lines in the flag of the state of Israel represent, the Nile and the Euphrates. And um, there's... Uh, the, the, there's definitely a lot of Israelis who just see that, and many of them mention it, that we need, you know, we need to just continue to expand and greater Israel will come about. So this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a situation where people just don't have, um, we're dealing with an ideology that doesn't have a respect for property rights because it believes in uh, religious stories overriding local property rights. So it doesn't matter that they went to Palestine, they accepted the property system of Palestinians. So they bought land from Palestinians, but they couldn't buy all of the land. You can't just buy a country. You buy 5% of the country over 40 years if you've got the Rothschilds and the British Empire helping you, you manage 5%. But you can't really buy the entire thing. And so you the, they, they knew that they had to resort to violence and they did resort to violence. But we've always had this idea that you can't have property rights independently of ethnicity. And I think this is what um, Israel apologists miss. So many of them will tell you this. And they make this, uh, what I believe is an extremely wrong argument, which is this idea that, well, uh, this is the reality of the world. The world is always about um, people with guns kill other people, and that's how it happens. Well, no, this is the reality of the jungle. And to the extent that we have a world, this, to the extent that we have a civilization, and I discussed this in depth in my third book, Principles of Economics, the extent to which are able, we are able to move away from jungles and move away from being monkeys in the jungle slinging our own feces at each other is our ability to get rid of that idea that we need to fight over everything and accept the principle of property right and accept that you have your own stuff, I have my own stuff, and then you get to work on making your stuff better and I get to work on making my things better so I have better home, better land, better tools, higher productivity. And that's what takes us out of the jungle and allows us to build civilization. Yeah. So no, we don't fight. This is the exception. This is us going back to the jungle. And this notion that you're just going to think, you know, this the, the, this um, modern internet think boy notion that we're just going to sit here enjoying all of the benefits of civilization that make these laptops and internet possible in the first place. And then sit and say, no, 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 actually the reality of the world is that uh, we're all just a bunch of um, violent animals fighting each other. No, <laughs> that's not why you have property right in your house. You don't wake up every morning and wrestle all pretenders to property in your house. It's well accepted in this country that everybody has a property right. And this is really the difference with Native Americans. Native Americans today in the U.S. can own property. Right. That's not the case for Palestinians. This is really what it comes down to. And also, I think, interestingly... Um, this is this I think would probably anger a lot of lefties, but the reality of the matter is that you can't really just say Israel is a colonialist project. You can't really compare it to 
a lot of the world's colonialist projects and, and the meaning of colonialism. And, you know, today, obviously, people overplay this term colonialism to refer to everything, um, just like racism and all of these uh, other isms that are used by uh, leftist opportunists. But realistically, um, there's a huge difference. White Europeans who showed up in Native America in, in North America. Uh, for the most part, did not deal with a system of private property that existed, which in the case of Palestine, it existed for 1300 years. So they went into a land in which you had nomadic tribes that primarily moved around. So if you settled an area that was unsettled, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't right. see anything wrong about white people in general that makes them guilty of this. Because for me, a, a, a Native American or a white person settling an area and fencing it off and homesteading it is legitimate for anybody. Now, of course, some of these white settlers did horrible things, but this is still very distinct from what's going on in Palestine. What's going on in Palestine is we've had a property rights system for 1,300 years, and it's a very well-respected property rights system that allows anybody from any ethnicity or race or religion to buy land and trade it. And now that's been replaced by a system where a military dictatorship essentially allocates that land to an agency that decides to allocate it to people from one ethnicity only. You think about other colonialisms, like the British colonialist project in India never even in my mind conceivably imagined that we would get rid of Indians and move British people to take over India. That was, as far as I know, I'd never heard of anybody who brought that up. And in for the most part, you know, British people had no interest in uh, colonizing Egypt in the same way that Israelis are colonizing Palestine. In Palestine, the idea is we need to get rid of these people. In uh, Egypt, uh, in Algeria, a lot of uh, the traditional property rights system that existed could survived through colonialism. So the colonialists took over the government of the situation, but they still administered property. And the, 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 the legitimacy of the existing property rights system is what gives any semblance of legitimacy to the government. The fact that this government is out there helping protect your right of property, which everybody in society accepts, is what allows you to accept the idea that, okay, maybe this government thing is legitimate. But if the entire purpose of government is to destroy the existing system of property rights and turn it into some uh, uh, socialist hellhole religious ethno-based system, it's very difficult to argue that that is the good side in a conflict. Yeah, I think I, I think you make a, a very compelling point, and I do think you're right that it is it is in a different category than traditional colonialism. All right, safe. Uh, we're we're out of time, and I got to go. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. I really appreciated it, uh, and it was great to hear your perspective. Let uh, let my audience know where they can go, uh, read your great books, or listen to your podcast, or any of that stuff. So my website is saifedeen.com, S-A-I-F-E-D-E-A-N. And then I have that same handle on Twitter. And also, um, you can uh, uh, you can also find my books on Amazon, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and the Principles of Economics. I highly, highly recommend uh, um, The Bitcoin Standard was excellent. I really enjoyed reading it. I got I to gotta read the other two, um, but I really did enjoy it. I should say also that my Standard. podcast, you guys listen to podcasts, so you might like The Bitcoin yes. Standard podcast one episode a week interesting stuff on the intersection of bitcoin palestine nutrition uh, climate change all kinds of uh, heretic thoughts <laughs> very good that's that's what our audience is into all right well thank you very much safe and thank you everybody for listening catch you next time peace